Hey, what's going on YouTube? This is CJ. Welcome back for another quick update on the 120 gallon reef. Now in this episode, we're going to focus on dosing, specifically related to the Aquamax T1 calcium reactor. Now if you're new to my channel, I've done two videos prior to this, one an unboxing and the second a full install detailing how I actually added this calcium reactor to my existing manifold, tied it into my existing pumps and plumbing. So definitely go back and check that out if you haven't watched it. Now my goal is, by the end of this video, for anyone that had questions, they'll have a full understanding of how this gas reactor works, how I tuned it, some of the side effects, the benefits, and ultimately guys, how this is probably going to be the best source of dosing and supplementing your tank for any size tank long term. So let's get to it. Now before we get going too far, quick disclaimer, just in case anyone is new to my channel, this is actually my first time ever using, running, or even thinking about trying a calcium reactor on any of my systems to this point in the hobby. So, you know, with that being said, there's been a lot of growing pains, you know, learning experiences I've had over the last two and a half months or so. I've been running this on my tank. And also, I don't have much to compare it to as far as personal use. So, you know, I'm just basically going to kind of document and share my experiences thus far. And if anyone, you know, has different types of calcium reactors or whatever the case may be, and you have any kind of helpful tips that may help anyone that's watching this video, feel free to drop it down in the comments below. But for now, let's go ahead and dive into this Aquamax T1 calcium reactor and share with you guys how it actually works on my system. Now, when it comes to what's inside the reactor, I'm running two different types of media at this time. First is gonna be the coarse aragonite or the R media. The second is gonna be the Neo Mag. Now between these two, the ultimate goal is for it to melt, break down, and release everything in equal parts that my tank needs. You know, related to the alkalinity, the calcium, the magnesium, trace elements, all released in a balanced manner, so that way my coils can take it up easier. Now for those that are interested in running this Aquamax calcium reactor, you can actually run this inside or external to the sump. You know, whether you push water through it with the Tom's Aqualifter pump or a low flow maxi jet or manifold, you know, the main goal is a steady, slow stream of water, low pressure inside the reactor and a low output coming out of it. So with all those things being said, it's up to you how you run it. As long as you can maintain it, that's the main part. So at this point, we're almost ready to go. You know, we got the reactor hooked up. We got the media going. We got the water running through it. But until we start melting the media, it's doing absolutely nothing for our tank. So it's time to introduce CO2. To be perfectly honest with you guys, this is probably the biggest hurdle for me personally. And the thing that made me the most nervous because I've never dealt with a can of pressurized gas. You know, I've never used a regulator and I just wasn't sure how it's going to work out. But ultimately, it ended up being very, very easy. You know, once you get your tank, you get your regulator hooked up to it. It's basically the case of finding a, a good controller to help control your regulator. Keep in mind, this does have a solenoid attached to it. You know, when the power is hooked up to it, it opens up, lets the CO2 gas through it. When the power is disconnected, it closes and shuts it off. So this is the part where having an Apex controller or a simple Milwaukee pH controller definitely can give you peace of mind, meaning it can help monitor and regulate the amount of CO2 you're using just in case you messed up something. It's a great safety net for anyone that's new to calcium reactors and I highly recommend it to the point to where I probably will not run one without it. Now besides controlling the CO2, another important thing to mention is going to be installing some kind of check valve on the CO2 line. You know, whenever the gas is open, it's all good, but whenever it's not, you could develop a back siphon and drain a lot of salt water back into your CO2 tank, which is definitely not something that you want happening. So. I don't know what kind of check valve you have available for you, but just make sure you have one that fits snug and doesn't allow anything to leak. So at this point, calcium reactor is fully connected. We got media, we have water, and now we have CO2 running into it. So with all that being said, now the fun part begins. And the biggest question is, how much CO2 do you use? How do you know how much you're using? So we're going to talk about that here for a moment. For anyone that's new, take a look on the left. You'll see that little tube chamber with the bubbles going up inside of it. That's referred to as the bubble counter. Now, depending on how many bubbles you see, that actually translates directly 
to how much CO2 is actually entering the reactor. Now this Aquamax calcium reactor, it actually has a single chamber with a recirculating pump. So all the CO2, the gas goes through this line, goes into the pump, and the pump actually pushes that gas and that water and that CO2 throughout the actual calcium reactor, recirculating it over and over and over until the pH gets down to where you want it. And now for the final part of the puzzle, also known as the output or the influent line from the calcium reactor. Now this is very, very important, you know, primarily because this is actually what's dosing your tank. You know, this is actually what's providing that CO2 rich, you know, trace element, mineral, alkalinity, calcium, everything else that is broken down as far as the media rich water into your tank. So without this being consistent, you're not getting consistent dosing. If you get this right, this is basically a 24 hour supply, an IV drip, so to say, of minerals and elements for your corals to feed on. That's the great part about a calcium reactor. Now something else to consider is how much this actually affects tuning the reactor because it also serves as a way to bleed CO2 from inside the calcium reactor itself. So it's a seesaw effect. You know, depending on how fast this water is coming out of here will also affect how much CO2 you need to maintain going into the reactor. So if you use less water coming out, you let, use less CO2 going in and you waste less CO2. In my situation, I've found that it's easier to have a steady stream, which also requires me to use more CO2. So this is not as simple as, you know, dosing two part or anything like that. It's not, hey, my tank uses this, so put this amount in, because you can accomplish the same with two different amounts of flow. You can have a highly, you know, saturated drip, accomplish the same thing as a lowly saturated stream. In either case, it does the same for your tank, and that's the beauty of a calcium reactor. So at this point, I know a lot of y'all may be wondering, you know, how do you know if you're doing it right? You know, what happens if something goes wrong? How do you protect yourself? For me, very, very simple. You know, I have an apex controller for a reason, so I'm taking advantage of it. I'm running two pH probes. One is inside the calcium reactor, has its separate probe, has a separate spot on my apex dashboard, and the second is going to be monitoring the pH of my tank, meaning making sure that the pH is staying consistent or at least not taking any nose dives in relation to the calcium reactor. So with all that being said, enter the apex. So let me give you guys a quick idea on how this thing's programmed. I actually have the apex control on the solenoid that's hooked up to the CO2 tank, meaning it's reading probe two, which is the pH probe inside my calcium reactor. And I currently had it set for if it got below 6.4, to turn off the calcium reactor or the CO2 going to it. But I'm gonna modify that. You know, the reason being, I had a larger window to protect myself, meaning, you know, if I overdose something to turn it off, but now that I've had less and less interruptions from the apex, meaning less times it had to save me from getting better at tuning it, now I'm gonna shorten the window a little bit more to where I want it. You know, the ultimate goal is to have the apex as a fail safe and not as the primary method of controlling the CO2. As with everything that's electronical, you know, if you have something turn it off and on over and over and over thousands of times, it will eventually fail. So I'm trying to avoid that. But with that being said, you know, it has saved me a few different times and I'm really glad that I have this controller, but you don't have to have an Apex. You know, there's a bunch of seasoned guys out there that actually have CO2 tanks and calcium reactors with no controller you know they just tune it by eye by bubble count and they're pretty good with that in my case you know apex is good in your case you may be able to get away with just a ph controller which is a lot cheaper but ultimately a controller is the way to go in my opinion and i would not recommend a calcium reactor without one now i know a lot of you all may be curious you know how is this affecting your tank's ph I haven't mentioned that yet to be perfectly honest it's not really much to talk about. You know, the great thing about this Apex and monitoring the pH over time is that it really gives you a good idea in tracking it, you know, with graphs and being able to compare graphs, which is what we're gonna look at now. So I'm gonna lay over the pH of my tank, which is the orange graph, with the pH of the calcium reactor, which is the red graph. You'll notice a kind of similar trend 
they both peak at different times during the day and they both drop at different times so the pH of the tank affects the calcium reactor and the calcium reactor has a small effect on the pH in my system but with all that being said it's not drastically different than it was without the calcium reactor running meaning it's still peaking at close to 8 and still dropping down to 7.8 ish 7.9 during the night which is a very very small swing considering you know I'm running a calcium reactor that only has one chamber that really doesn't have anything else special to help remove the additional CO2 now I believe my system is set up in a way to where it can help process it we'll talk about that here in a moment but as far as the effects the graphs don't lie and I'm pretty happy with the results now I have to admit to you guys still a novice when it comes to the programming language and you know all the power and capabilities of this APEC but I recently did discover you can track your parameters inside this meaning the alkalinity the calcium magnesium you know phosphates all of that and graph it so graphs definitely paint a clear picture of what's happening in your system and I'm here to tell you guys for anyone that's curious about calcium reactors and the thought that hey they can't raise your parameters you know they only keep things stable here to tell you that is false meaning the rise in this chart from 7 dkh peaking at around 10.5 dkh was solely caused by the calcium reactor I have not done a water change in almost three months since I started running the calcium reactor have not dosed two part everything that has risen in my system is a result of either me overdosing the fluent line or doing something to manipulate it with the calcium reactor so keep that in mind you gotta make sure you pay attention to your parameters now for those that are curious or may be experiencing you know low pH issues in your tank with a calcium reactor there's four steps you can do or at least what I believe on my system is helping combat that you know first and foremost I'm sucking in fresh oxygenated air with my skimmer I actually have the line running outside the tank and outside the door you know it's winter time now it's cold outside the air doesn't have any pollen or you know debris or mold or dust or anything it's just cold fresh oxygenated air sucking into my tank so you know that's stirring up inside the skimmer and helping raise the pH in my system the second biggest factor has to be the algae scrubber on my system I don't think it's a coincidence that this thing has been growing like a madman for the last two, three, four months, honestly, on my system. You know, the excess CO2, you know, with the light and the nutrients in my system definitely has caused an explosion of growth on this algae scrubber. I just cleaned it yesterday and I expect to have to clean it, you know, within three or four days again. So, you know, whether you have an algae scrubber, refugium, chato, any kind of refugium will help with this. And last but not least, water agitation guys I purposely have the fluid line running into the first chamber of my sump very very high flow then that water waterfalls over into the skimmer section where it meets that you know oxygenated water from outside and then that's followed up by tons and tons of surface agitation which also further helps gas off that CO2 in my system so you know I think all those things help contribute to the pH in my tank not really you know batting an eye and adding a calcium reactor is that still going to stay the case forever who knows but at this point you know two and a half three months with running it i'm definitely satisfied with the results so far so at this point what kind of issues have i had with the calcium reactor because you know in this hobby everything is not always sunny days you know peaches and cream rainbows and skittles it's not always good times but with that being said i believe every issue i've had with the calcium reactor has been user error honestly you know keep in mind my calcium reactor is running through my manifold so that manifold is purely dependent on me not touching it which I have a problem with doing here recently any adjustment I make to a valve you know flow to a pump if I turn anything do anything different that manipulates the flow through that manifold it changes the back pressure which also changes the flow through my calcium reactor which also creates a chain effect changing the CO2 changing the pH and changing how much it's dosing my tank so as a direct result of that you know I've had a couple of incidents where the pH inside the reactor has dropped right below where I wanted it and right above where the apex shuts it off and I have accidentally overdosed my tank slightly you know the biggest overdose I experienced was a, G a DKH jump 
from 9.3 to 10.5 over a few days. Ultimately, over a few days isn't that bad, but it jumping is the concern. So, you know, that's just kind of a lesson learned for me personally. But for anyone out there, basically the, the lesson is just don't touch it and it's fine. But if you do like touching the equipment, may be better off using an external pump or a standalone pump to provide for your calcium reactor so that way it's not affected by those things but i may change to that in the future who knows but for now i'm gonna keep pushing the limits and uh run it how it is and just tune my apex you know the window to a shorter window to help protect myself just a little bit more so at this point i know some of you all may be on the fence you know you may be currently dosing two part or getting to the point to where you actually want to start dosing something to your tank and you're trying to decide calcium reactor, you know, two part or calquas or whatever the case may be, I would say just consider a few things. You know, first and foremost, what kind of corals are you going to keep? You know, do you want hard corals like I have? Do you want SPS corals or even LPS corals that have branching skeletons, you know, hard skeletons with them? Anything with a hard skeleton in your reef tank will consume more of your parameters than a coral with soft skeletons, meaning leather corals, mushrooms, anemones, anything that is all soft corals will not consume as much because they don't need to build as much. So let that be your first guide as far as which direction you want to go, because you can have a very large system full of soft corals and honestly not need a calcium reactor because of that. So, you know, with that being the first thing out of the way, second thing to consider is going to be the size of your system also how scalable the solution is going to be meaning are you going to spend a thousand dollars up front on a calcium reactor for a very large tank and have that calcium reactor be enough forever you know meaning you just turn up the co2 and you're covered or are you going to try going two part on a very large system to where you may see exponential growth over the first two years and before you know it that one gallon of two part turns into two gallon turns into three gallons turns into four gallons at some point you're going to realize that maybe you should have just went with the calcium reactor up front to begin with so you know is it scalable is it going to fit the needs of what you want to keep in your tank let those be your guide as far as which direction you want to go with supplementing your system so at this point this video has been dragging on a little longer than i want it to even though we still have a lot more we have not you know covered as far as the consumption of my tank, trace elements, and all of those things that I'm dosing. So that is will be saved for a future vid. So let's go ahead and get on out of here. And as always, guys, you all can like, comment, subscribe. You guys keep doing what y'all do. Y'all be easy and happy reefing.